Good evening to all of you. Hope you are well. Welcome back to the digital platform of Shadhan Chandra Mohabindala. I am here with the third session of the special lecture series being conducted by Department of English. I am Gautam Maji, an assistant professor as well as uh, head of Department of English, Shadhan Chandra Mohabindala. In this uh, third session, uh, we have a very special guest. Uh, Dr. Shoura Banerjee, and uh, he is going to cover a special topic from Macbeth. And uh, along with uh, Shoura Banerjee, we have another very special guest, our Honorable Principal Sir, uh, Dr. Uh, Sheikh Fojul Haq. So I would like to welcome Dr. Sheikh Fojul Haq as well as Dr. Shoura Banerjee. So before beginning our session, so I would like to ask our Honorable Principal Sir, so please could you uh, uh, say a very few words uh, regarding the special lecture series being organized by Department of English. Then we'll uh, go back to our uh, guest speaker and I will tell that uh, which topic is going to cover. Then we will begin our session. So, first of all, I would like to uh, welcome our uh, Honorable Principal Sir to say a few words regarding the special lecture series being conducted by Department of Good evening. And welcome to all of you. As you know, the Department of English of our college, under the leadership of our beloved teacher, Gautam Maji, assistant professor and head of the department, has arranged lecture series to share knowledge of English language and literature to our students, as well as students, scholars, and faculty members of other institutes. Today is the third lecture. Dr. Soro Banerjee, Associate Professor of Mohitos Nandi Mohavidalaya, has agreed to spare his valuable time as a speaker for this session. The topic is Lady Macbeth and the Word Sisters analyzing gender and power in Macbeth. I wish to thank Dr. Banerjee for accepting our invitation. In this COVID-19 pandemic lockdown period, online mode of online mode of higher education is the only way online mode of higher education is the only way of exchange views knowledge as well as teaching learning process it helps to relieve stress anxiety tension etc to some extent in this crisis period hope dr banerji will fulfill our expectation and the session after all will be interactive and helpful to all participants. Thanks a lot to all of you. Be safe and keep safe to all. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, our Honorable Principal Sir, for uh, wonderful words for uh, for Department of English as well as for our guest speaker. So, uh, first of all, I'd like to convey my heartfelt thanks to uh, Dr. Banerjee for accepting our invitation as uh, you have already found that our principals are also uh, conveyed uh, his thanks to you. Uh, so, I would uh, uh, like to uh, say that uh, Dr. Banerjee, uh, thank you very much for accepting once again. Uh, so, uh, the topic that he is going to cover uh, uh, from Macbeth Lady Macbeth and uh, the Weird Sisters analyzing gender and power in Macbeth. Before giving the full uh, section or full platform to Dr. Banerjee, I would like to request all of you who are watching us live on, on this page. Uh, if you have any question, you can drop the question in the comment box and we will get back to our uh, honorable guest just after the completion of his lecture with your questions. I hope. Uh, your questions will be answered properly. So please be patient and keep 
dropping questions in the comment box. So, uh, first of all, I would like to know, Dr. Saur Banerjee, what are you feeling? Because uh, this is our honor to have uh, you uh, in our special lecture series. So, could you say something? Then we'll uh, go uh, totally into this uh, lecture series. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm actually uh, honored that you have asked me to speak and you have let me choose a topic of my own liking. So uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Hawk, Sabhan Chandra Mahavidyalai, and Gautam for giving me this opportunity of speaking on this topic. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Shora Banerjee. Dr. Shora Banerjee, rather, because I'm just uh, Dr. Shora Banerjee. So uh, uh, could we begin our session now? Yeah, sure, sure. OK, so OK, I'm just giving okay. you the entire space. Uh, and we are going in that session. Could you just give me the first slide? Yes, of course. Yes, yes, definitely. I'm so, doing this uh, thing. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. So, once again, good evening, everybody. And I'm going to begin my lecture. The topic, as you know, is Lady Macbeth and the Weird Sisters Analyzing Gender and Power in Macbeth. So, let us start at the very beginning. William Shakespeare's Macbeth was most likely written in 1606, three years into the reign of James I, who was James VI of Scotland since 1567, before he achieved the English throne in 1603. Macbeth is Shakespeare's shortest tragedy, yet it is one of his most influential and intense plays. Macbeth deals with the question of kingship, the problems of legitimacy, succession, political power of the monarchs, and of course, concern about gender. Uh, can we uh, want to next slide, Gautam? So as we all know uh, that this is a tragedy, so I'll begin by uh, defining tragedy, and Aristotle has defined tragedy as an imitation of an action that is serious, complete, and of a certain magnitude, in language embellished with each kind of artistic ornament in the form of action, not of narrative, with incidents arousing pity and fear, wherewith to accomplish its catharsis of such emotions. Next slide, please. So uh, we also know that Aristotle had, uh, Gautam, could you move to the next slide, please? Given us the four qualities of a tragic hero. He had said that a tragic hero has to be good, representative, consistent, and flawed. By good, he meant not only morally good, as in a good boy, bad boy. Obviously, the hero had to be morally good, but he also, be, uh, he also had to be socially good, meaning that he had to be of a high social status so that his downfall might create an impact, a great impact on the society. The second is representative. What he meant by that was that the hero must represent his class. So, so as to say, if the hero is a king, then he must behave like the average kings, the other kings. He must not be idiosyncratic. The third is that consistent. The hero must, the hero's characteristics must be consistent from the beginning to the end. And even if the hero is shown to be inconsistent, then he must be consistently inconsistent from the beginning to the end. And Obviously, the hero must have a flaw. Uh, it was believed that no matter how good the hero is, the hero must have at least one tragic flaw, which will be the cause of his downfall. Uh, next slide, please. Now, uh, we'll be talking about Shakespeare, and I've talked about Aristotle. So there's one major difference between a classical tragedy and Shakespearean tragedy. And uh, I'd like to clear that before I move on. In the classical tragedy, it is fate that determines the action and the result. While in the Shakespearean tragedy, it is character that determines the action and the result. For example, uh, if we take Oedipus, it was Oedipus's fate that he would murder his uh, father and marry his own mother. No matter what he would have done, he could not have avoided that. But there is no such thing in Macbeth Macbeth was under no compulsion, either of fate or whatever, to murder Duncan. It was his own conscious choice. He could not have murdered if he chose to. And that is why it is said that in the Shakespearean play, character is 
destiny. This is basically a debate between predetermined fate of the classical tragedies versus free will of the Renaissance or the Shakespearean tragedy. Now, uh, it is generally believed that Macbeth's tragic flaw is his ambition. The thing that brings him down is his ambition. But the question is, why should ambition in Macbeth, who is a war hero, be a tragic flaw? From the very beginning of the play, he is described variously as Valor's minion, Bellona's bridegroom. He wins two battles in a single day, one against MacDonald and the other against the Norwegian king, assisted by the most disloyal Thane of Cawdor. So was it very wrong for Macbeth to harbor ambitions of becoming the next king? Especially when the person whom Duncan names the next king, his eldest born son Malcolm, is shown uh, to not be a very heroic character. Remember, uh, he is saved from captivity by the ser sergeant and he flees the battlefield, leaving the dirty work to be done by Macbeth and Banquo and the rest. Also, one more point to note is that primogeniture was not valid in, in Scotland uh, when the play was set. The play was set actually in 1040 to 1057, uh, although the play was written in 1606. So at that time, in Scotland, there was, was the, there was no rule of primogeniture. Primogeniture actually refers to that rule where the king's eldest born child is the automatic choice for being the next king. In fact, in Scotland at that time, the rule was that after the present king, the next best person from amongst the uh, kinsmen of the king would become the next king. So I don't think Macbeth was uh, or could be wrong for harboring thoughts of ambition. But ambition becomes his tragic flaw, not because of ambition itself, but because of the method he employed to achieve his ambition. Shakespeare uses ambition in this way to examine gender roles and power. It is popularly believed that Macbeth got the idea of murdering King Duncan because of the prophecy of the witches or from the prophecy of the witches and committed the actual murder because of the instigation of Lady Macbeth. So does it then imply that the man Macbeth is basically good, but he has gone bad because of the women, the bad women in the play? Uh, can we move on to the next slide, please, Gautam? Yes. Now, since I'm talking about uh, man and woman, uh, let me clarify something. There is a basic difference between sex and gender. So the title uh, of my lecture today, I have used the word gender and not sex. Now, sex is biological. Sex is a biological condition, a condition with which we are born, either male or female, XX or XY chromosomes. But gender is actually a social construct. It is what society teaches us to be, uh, the definition of a... But some things remain constant. In all ages, certain characteristics are associated with men and a very different set of characteristics are associated with the women. But remember, all aimed at disadvantaging the woman. This is in line with one of Michel Foucault's most fertile insight into the workings of power at the micro-political level. His identification of the body and sexuality as the direct locus of social control. Now, even during Shakespeare's time, women were not thought to be smart or equal to men. They were regarded only as delicate little creatures who were there to give birth and look pretty. Shakespeare reflects this Renaissance distinction between and joining of the masculine and the feminine, a juxtaposition which is also apparent in the female monarch of his day, Queen Elizabeth. Now, uh, the ladies in the audience, if you have somehow felt bad when you have come of age and you go to any family gathering or when guests visit you and you're asked, when are you getting married? So don't feel bad about it. You are in some elite company. The chief worry of the Elizabethan males was to get Queen Elizabeth married off to someone so that she could produce children, preferably a male heir. Surely, she knew that if she had done just that, 
she would have lost the great power she had as an unmarried renaissance female prince elizabeth of course was not an ordinary person and she was also not above playing with gender distinctions when it was to her advantage therefore uh, can i move on to the next slide gautam in july 1588 in her famous speech to the troops at tilbury who had gathered for the landing of the spanish armada gautam can we uh, have the next slide please yes 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 yeah elizabeth played both the female and the male role i quote i know i have the body but of a weak and feeble woman but i have the heart and stomach of a king and a king of england too i myself will take up arms i myself will be your general judge and rewarder of every one of your virtues in the field unquote now please remember that it was in such a society with clear cut and biased notions of masculinity and femininity that shakespeare portrays his lady macbeth so in keeping with this man brave and good and women weak and bad concept even in describing the war exploits of macbeth the sergeant compares fortune to a revels whore implying the bewitching of wealth with the feminine this also suggests that macbeth who embodies the masculine has destroyed fortune which embodies the feminine duncan too uh, if you remember welcomes him in masculine terms of endearment like a valiant cousin worthy gentleman and so on and so forth so uh, by now macbeth is established as the archetypal male hero dauntless yet modest and loyal and there is no doubt about the bravery of macbeth amongst the men folk in the play so far but something very strange happens in act 1 scene 5 of the play when we come to lady macbeth well as she is reading finish just finished reading uh, the letter that macbeth has uh, sent to her she subverts this image of macbeth and estimates him as quote unquote too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way lady macbeth accuses her husband of the feminine quality of having milk a stark contrast to his exploits in the battle so far and his macho image but she is the wife of macbeth and so we assume that she should and she does know him better at least in the domestic sphere she uh, then tries to compensate macbeth's lack of masculinity by desiring to be unsexed and having her milk replaced with gall this is the beginning uh, in the play from where the gender roles begin to subvert in the human characters in this way the renaissance view on unnatural masculinity and femininity is expressed the established trope in literature of the hesitant and worrisome woman and the power hungry man is a flip with the macbeths john larson clean in the essay titled lady macbeth in form of purpose illustrates that lady macbeth equates femininity to weakness and therefore she feels that macbeth has too much kindness or womanliness and thus weakness in him to commit the murder the murder is a very different thing from the state sanctioned killings in the battlefield which macbeth is so accustomed to or rather we can say he is a master of therefore the macbeth who doesn't think twice before killing people and unseeming them from the nape to the chops feels hesitant in murdering someone uh coming back to lady macbeth by the extension of her own logic that women are too weak to kill lady macbeth too cannot commit murder by virtue of being a woman alternatively she can be the aggressor making macbeth believe the witch's prophecy and murder the king duncan shakespeare substantially emphasizes the male female relationship and gender dynamic he portrays women as major determinants in men's actions so lady macbeth implores macbeth to come to her quickly uh, can we move to the next slide please gautam she wants 
Lady uh, Macbeth. Lady Macbeth wants Macbeth to come to her very, very quickly. Can we move to the next slide, please, Gautam? This one complete. Okay. Yeah. Uh, next slide, please. Gautam, can we move to the next slide, please? Yes, I am doing it. Yeah. Okay. So she says. She wants Macbeth to come to her quickly, as she says, I quote, that I may pour my spirits in thine ear and chastise with the valor of my tongue all that impedes thee from the golden round. Act one, scene five. Uh, I'm actually waiting for Gautam to put up the slide. Uh, I'm, I'm changing it. Could you get that or not? I'm changing it. Uh, no, we don't have it on the screen. Okay, 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 okay. I'm telling. Okay, okay. No, not this one, not this one. Okay, I'm uh, doing move it. Move up, please. This one? Uh, yes, this yes, yes, yes. Yes, correct. Yes. So, so she says that she wants Macbeth to come to her quickly so that she may pour her spirit into Macbeth's ear and make Macbeth into a person who will be willing to or agree to murder King Duncan. Now, here I'm talking about two allusions. Here I find two allusions of pouring the spirit in the ear. One is obviously the Christian uh, allusion, uh, which is obviously good. We know that all Christians are chastised, are made pure by the pouring of the spirit of Christ into their ears, because when they hear the, the, the sermons of Christ, when they hear the sermons of Christianity, the spirits are kind of chastised, they become pure, noble souls. But Shakespeare, in Shakespeare, this is subverted. This gets reversed. Lady Macbeth was also wants to pour her spirit into Macbeth's ears, but not to make him a good person, to convert him into a mur murderer. Now, I think Shakespeare, in taking this Christian illusion and reversing it, makes it all the more stark. Remember, Shakespeare will be writing another play called Hamlet, uh, three years later in 1609. And there he'll take this pouring of the spirit into the air for harmful purposes to, a, to the next level. Because there, King Hamlet, Hamlet's father, will be killed by Claudius by pouring poison through his ears. Okay. At this point of the play, Lady Macbeth has a greater say in their relationship by virtue of having more valor in non-war situations. Yet, she is envious of Macbeth for getting the opportunity to kill Duncan when she feels he is not fit enough to deserve it. She is convinced that she deserves that opportunity. Hence, it is therefore that she desires her milk to be replaced with gall, her blood thickened, and she be filled with direst cruelty. Her conviction is that if she was a man, she could have done anything to get what she wanted, unlike Macbeth. And despite being a woman, she would, as she tells Macbeth, had she so promised, I quote, have plucked my nipples from his boneless gums and dashed the brains out had I so sown, as you have done to this, unquote. So obviously she is here referring to an infant child or her infant child who she has given suck to, but she is saying that had I so sown, I would have, I mean, killed it while it was, I mean, feeding milk from me. Yet, despite all her yearnings, she has to depend on Macbeth to perform the actual murder because she cannot shake off the infirmity that she possesses by virtue of being encased in a woman's body. When the time comes to act in a very enlightening soliloquy, she reveals both to herself and to the audience I quote, had he not resembled my father as he slept, I had done it. Unquote. This is act two, scene two. This is the first instance in the play that we find Lady Macbeth not live up to her tall claims. A great fiction now occurs in the play about the concept of masculinity. Masculinity is not the unflinching ability to kill as Lady Macbeth thinks it is to be. Then... Uh, there starts a war, a war not in the battlefield, but between 
the husband and the wife over supremacy in their relationship although the macbeths occupy a very high position in society they are unhappy and they think they deserve more their uh, marriage in itself is an indication of this and neither happy neither appear happy rather with the qualities possessed by the other a married relationship should be a complementary one but the macbeths vie for control over each other they try to impose their ideas over the other and to mold him or her macbeth tries to do so uh, through his logic and an appeal to the feminine nature of lady macbeth and she appeals to macbeth's masculinity the more she invokes masculinity in macbeth the lesser she wants to own her femininity it becomes a relationship ultimately between two persons a non female and a hyper male and as we all can understand nothing good will come out of such a relationship and nothing good does and once lady macbeth unleashes the brute side of macbeth she herself cannot handle it when macbeth returns from murdering king duncan i am talking about act 2 uh, scene 2 lady macbeth asks my husband quote unquote there is a question mark at the end of this uh, this phrase my husband but it is more of an exclamation than a question it is actually a shocking discovery of what he has become after he is forced to perform things he did not want to do in the first place from here on in the play lady macbeth loses control both on macbeth and on herself the only other times that she is seen uh, in the drama that is is when the murder is discovered act 2 scene 3 but uh, if you remember there too she faints and again we see her when she tries to salvage the situation in the banquet scene act 3 uh, scene 4 thereafter we see lady macbeth once in the sleep walking scene act 5 scene 1 and here of a self inflicted death in act 5 scene 5 in between she is no longer in her senses as her guilt has taken a heavy toll on her a direct result of her trying to go against her nature her desire had far outweighed her capacity although she desired unsexing her sensitivity had never deserted her proved by her inability to murder king duncan herself and her becoming insane later on the other hand if we see that macbeth had not done anything in the play that he couldn't handle he was aware of the price he would have to pay if he murdered duncan he knew that if he murdered duncan or once he murdered duncan uh, one he could not expect the mercy of god two he would not be able to sleep again and three he would never be able to trust anyone again. he knew that if he murdered to gain what he coveted he would have to keep on murdering to consolidate his position so he becomes almost like a serial serial killer as the play progresses uh, we can say therefore that everything lady macbeth wanted in an attempt to be masculine like gall thickening of blood and no compunctions macbeth achieved and all the things that macbeth possessed and lady macbeth derided as unwom unmanly rather being sensitive and guilt ridden is exhibited by macbeth towards the end of the play in portraying this exchange of gender norms between macbeth and lady macbeth shakespeare was perhaps trying to show how it shatters the social norms of masculinity and femininity uh, and here i'll be talking a little about Uh, something that the elizabethans believed in all the great chain of being uh, gautam can you just uh, put up the next slide please yes i'm good yeah uh, the great chain of being the great chain of being uh will you find it yes yeah yeah sure it's okay so uh, what happens is that the scholars E.M.W. Tilliard and A.O. Lovejoy argued that the medieval and Renaissance world inherited a special worldview 
the idea of a hierarchical universe ordained by God. The chain of being describes this medieval and Renaissance structure as an interconnected chain of greater and lesser links. Each link in the chain was an individual species of being, creature, or object. Those links higher on the chain possessed greater intellect, mobility, and the capability than those lower on the chain. Accordingly, the higher links had more authority over the lower place links. Uh, go to move on to the next slide, please. So as we can see that at the top of the chain, there is God, then there are the angels, and then human beings, and then the animals, and then the plants, and then the minerals. So uh, the men being uh, somewhere in the middle are above the animal kingdom. So it was thought that it was their right to take control of the animals. Like he could, he could control a horse. He had the right to control a horse. And the horse, in turn, had the right over the grass. So he, it could trample the grass or eat up the grass. And the grass, in turn, had its own authority over the minerals from which it could sustain uh, its food. So there was nothing wrong in that. And uh, from the chart also, we can see that, uh, although it is not mentioned in the chart, I'm sorry, that ma the man in this chain had a very unique position. It was believed, uh, which is called Renaissance optimism, that man, by virtue of his good work, would rise in the chain, almost to the level of being an angel. But there was a reverse side, the flip side also, that man, by virtue of his bad works, and this is Renaissance pessimism, would fall to the level of an animal or even worse. So now what happens is that uh, in between, uh, sorry, I mean, in the individual being, say, for example, man, man was not a very homogeneous entity in this chain. Every, every link had its own hierarchy. So within man, you had the king at the top and the laborers at the bottom. Again, in the family, if you can uh, see the slide at the uh, bottom right-hand corner, in the family, there was a hierarchy too. The man was at the head of the family, then came the wife, and then the male children, and then the female children in order of birth. Now, what I'm trying to say is that Lady Macbeth, in trying to take control of Macbeth and trying to become the head of the family, is breaking this Elizabethan chain of being. Not only she, in fact, Macbeth also does the same. He also tries to usurp the position of the king. So this, this is grossly unjust according to the Elizabethan standards. And this creates a kind of chaos, not only in the family of the Macbeths, not only in their society, not only in the kingdom, but since any ill effect in any link of the chain would create a ripple effect throughout the chain. And therefore, the ripple effects would be felt in the cosmos. And that is why we have the unnatural events happening after Duncan's murder like uh, the owl hunting down the falcon and the horses of Duncan trying to eat, eat up each other and so on and so forth. So whenever you break the chain, Lady Macbeth is doing so, Macbeth is doing so, there are these turmoils in society and the cosmos. Through this, Shakespeare was trying to explore how trying to forcefully transform gender constructs can turn a family into a dysfunctional one and how also it plunges a respectable couple into butcher and fiend like entities, at, as Malcolm calls the Macbeths in Act 5, Scene 9 of the play, thereby holding up the dichotomy with which the play began. And I quote, fair is foul, foul is fair, unquote. So far, so good. But now let us take a different perspective. When men are portrayed as strong willed and courageous, we celebrate them. But when a female character like Lady Macbeth exhibits the same characteristics, she is seen as a ruthless and power-hungry personality. She is seen not only as evil, but as a monster, a witch. In fact, she is seen by many critics and readers as the fourth witch of the play. According to Philip McGuire, when Shakespeare wrote Macbeth, the witches were associated with, and I quote, afflicting all that is considered unholy, ungodly and unnatural. They embody a specter of a world in which women rule over men." Unquote. So now it becomes easy to see why Lady Macbeth was not simply evil, but was also seen as the fourth witch. Uh, can we move on to the next slide, please, Gautam? 
even so much so that lady macbeth has proven uh, go to the next slide please proven to be a harder case to rehabilitate for the critics than the witches her place in critical history is not very encouraging uh, go to next slide please am i audible okay i'll continue so uh, i was talking about the critical history and lady bell's portrayal in it so christina alfer has observed her character that is lady macbeth's character gotham uh, if you can hear me can you put up the next slide please christina yes, alfer yes, had yes. observed her character a uh, court is one of almost peerless malevolence and uh, here we are all reminded of a very similar comment by coleridge when he uh, talks of the motiveless malignity of yago so uh, lady macbeth uh, almost becomes in yago's league even levin joanna said that lady macbeth's unbinding femininity seems to show the reflection of a political issues of gender uh, sorry the reflection of political issues of gender and power of the time as macbeth quote becomes the offspring of a disorderly feminine imagination unquote the dominant image of lady macbeth is that of a sort of monster abnormally hard abnormally cruel these representations portray lady macbeth as little more than a synonym for an ambitious murderous woman or a desiccated housewife but is it the truth or is it the image that we have been conditioned to see and believe our views are influenced by the traditional concepts and what the critics have told us so uh, we see our first impression of macbeth is not by reading the text from a very early age we are conditioned to believe in things and see things in a certain way so even with shakespeare uh, so you see our first exposure to shakespeare in an early age was perhaps through charles and mary lamb's tales from shakespeare and there the impression that we get about lady macbeth is that i quote she was a bad woman ambitious woman a woman not easily shaken from her evil purpose and finally she dies unable to bear the remorse of guilt and public hate in the recent centuries there uh, sorry in the recent century there has been an attempt uh, to paint a very different picture of this fiend like queen but most of these works seek an explanation or rational for her participation in duncan's murder through various extra textual strategies one by reference to her earlier marriage and son by that marriage as found in hollinshed's chronicles of scotland but su suppressed in shakespeare's play two to her situation as a woman in a culture of celtic masculinity and three even to a supposed daughter with whom lady macbeth is ultimately reunited resulting in the portrayal of a repentant heroic even innocent and above all a maternal lady macbeth the character's origins lie in the accounts of king duff and duncan in hollinshed's chronicle a history of britain with which shakespeare was very familiar Shakespeare's Lady Macbeth also appears to be a composite of two separate and distinct personages in Hollinshed's work. A, Donald's nagging murderous wife in the accounts of King Duff, and two, Macbeth's ambitious wife Grouch of Scotland in the account of King Duncan. Uh, even according to some genealogists, Lady Macbeth and King Duncan's wife were siblings or cousins. where duncan's wife had a stronger claim to the throne than lady macbeth and this was what incited her jealousy and hatred of duncan uh, but even without referring to such external sources and later adaptations and prequels and sequels we can still defend lady macbeth the work of feminist scholars like dian perkis dimna callaghan peter stralivas and helen ostovich among many others have gone far to place lady macbeth and the plays which is in context of patriarchal religious 
social and political discourses if we compare the character of lady macbeth with the only other uh, character of her stature in this play that is lady macbeth we find that lady macduff is the example of the perfect wife docile domesticated depending upon the male even for her mere survival she can only rant and cry when left alone by macduff at the mercy of macbeth uh, but she cannot even question i mean she does so but in the mildest possible way uh, even at the risk of being killed along with her son she is shown as a caring uh, mother she has a son unlike lady macbeth who refers to an infant but is never seen in the play so these make lady macduff fit the bill of the typical wife mother and all that society could ask a woman to conform to and lady macbeth in being unlike her is more like the witches of the play so this is a contrast that shakespeare deliberately creates to portray lady macbeth in a bad image what i am trying to say is that lady macbeth is normal as good or as bad a person as anyone is in their everyday lives her problem is that unlike the other women of her times she does not conform to types she is not a fairy tale heroine she takes things in her own hands in order to realize her husband's dream even if it meant doing wrong things and stretching herself beyond her limits of endurance nowhere in the play Uh, does she say the word queen you will never find any reference in the play where she says that i want to be a queen no it is all for macbeth which we seem to very conveniently forget about her she actually becomes a very convenient scapegoat for making macbeth appear the good hero gone wrong at the instigation of an evil wife this definitely helps in whitewashing macbeth to some extent or rather why to some extent to a great extent so as to project him as a tragic hero but it is grossly unjust towards lady macbeth she is a woman who loved immensely but not wisely enough and was perhaps perhaps born much ahead of her times and now uh, i'll come to the witches shakespeare disrupts uh, the notions of femininity from the first scene of the play with the description of the witches or the weird sisters as they are called at the very beginning the witches of the weird sisters break this clear cut male female demarcation the physical description of the witches as banco says and i quote you should be women and yet your beards forbid me to interpret that you are so unquote even macbeth says i quote speak if you can what are you unquote macbeth says what not even who now why does this concept of the witch become so important it is because when shakespeare wrote macbeth witchcraft was a topic of considerable interest in england and europe it reflected king james the first passion in the study of witchcraft uh, remember in 1597 uh, he wrote demonology an influential text gautam can you move on to the next slide please an influential text uh, in which he contended that witchcraft was a reality and that its practitioners must be punished so uh, when james the first became the king of england in 1603 his book demonology was published in london as well his fascination with witches was well known and no doubt shakespeare composed macbeth in 1606 using uh, using hollinshed's chronicles as his source to please the new king i say so because an eyewitness uh, account by uh, by some doctor simon forman dates the first public performance of macbeth at the globe outdoor globe theater in april 1611 although it was most likely that the play was performed for the first time before king james the 1st in his court in either august uh, or december 1606 uh, please come to the next slide gautam uh, to me the witches in this play can be a uh, can we have the next slide please to me the witches in the play can be interpreted as uh, the following four things either the microcosmic agents of the macrocosmic evil or real life witches who practice black magic or three poor women whose poverty hormonal imbalance age and appearance gave them a strange and fearful look 
which they use to frighten people for their survival and four the they are the external manifestations of the internal evils of macbeth but whatever they are they appeal to the heterogeneous composition of shakespeare's audience or spectators now uh, i'll go into details in each of these the first coming to the first that they are uh, the macrocosmic agents of the macrocosmic evil dian perkis in her article which is in macbeth has referred to the great chain of being that i discussed a little earlier in interpreting the role of the witches as being the microcosmic agents of the macrocosmic mm-hmm. evil she has reiterated the fact that in shakespeare's time everyone believed that the macrocosm of the whole state could be influenced by the microcosmic acts and disturbances so it is believed that the witches do not actually corrupt macbeth they contact macbeth because there is already evil in macbeth uh, this is very easy to understand if you take a look at the the mobile phone theory the signals are already in the sky airtel aircel whatever docomo jio but they don't bother you until and unless you have an android phone the moment you have an android phone uh, if you think that of an evil as an evil the agents of the macrocosmic evil the signal companies the agents of the companies will keep poking you to take their connection whether you take it whether you leave it whether you, what you use it for is entirely up to you so a uh, bad analogy but a good way to understand this concept now these witches do not want to hover over macbeth or guide him into evil they recognize quote unquote something wicked already present in him give him words and visions that echo his desires and vanish permanently from the play uh gotham can we move on to the next slide please uh, although it is very strongly believed that macbeth contemplated murdering duncan before meeting the witches uh, i can give four concrete evidences from the text that will prove that macbeth had already contemplated murdering the king duncan before he met the witches the first is when ross addresses him as the thane of cawdor macbeth uh, starts believing that the prophecy of his becoming king will also come true but as he says in his soliloquy if good why do i yield to that suggestion whose horrid image doth unfix my hair act 1 c in 3 he unconsciously is associating the murdering of king duncan with his becoming the next king and this could not be at the spur of the moment he must have thought of it before meeting the witches the second is that just after king duncan has named malcolm the prince of cumberland malcolm against uh, macbeth again says i quote let not light see my black and deep desires the eye wink at the hand yet let that be which the eye fears when it is done to see obviously such a secret deed can only signify the murder of the king and obviously also this cannot have been thought i mean this would not have been thought at the spur of the moment macbeth must have been thinking about it before meeting the witches the third instance is when lady macbeth reads macbeth's letter in act 1 scene 5 she is even afraid to pronounce kingship and calls it what thou art promised she reveals that macbeth does not lack the ambition but only the illness that should attend it proving that she and must macbeth must have discussed kingship before otherwise how does she know that macbeth has the ambition and not the illness and the fourth and the clinching evidence is when lady macbeth chastises macbeth when he refuses to go ahead with the murder of king duncan in act 1 scene 8 saying quote what beast was it then that make made you break this enterprise to me unquote obviously macbeth says you are my partner in greatness and they are meeting i mean this is the second time they are meeting after macbeth has come back from the war and so the enterprise was broken to her before meeting the witches so we can say with conviction that murdering king duncan was a long thought out plan even before meeting the witches as the pair is shown to share everything with each other now i'll come to the second uh, interpretation of the witches as real life women practicing black magic society actually believed it and since the reformation witchcraft in england had become a statutory crime imagine statutory crime the first statute against it was passed in 1542 but this was repealed in 1547 a more severe one was passed in 1563 early in elizabeth's reign but the harshest of all was passed in 1604 
soon after James the sixth of Scotland became James the first of England. Uh, next slide, please. When uh, James the sixth was still king of Scotland, he had become convinced about the reality of witchcraft and its great danger to him, and he started the trials, witchcraft trials, that began in 1591. James the sixth himself interrogated the North Berwick witches as members of the coven that raised a tempest on the North Sea with the sole intent, or that is what he thought, of shipwrecking the king on his wedding journey home from Denmark, Norway. So remember, we have the sailor reference in this text. That is perhaps uh, Shakespeare was referring to this, whether the whether witch says that uh, I'll go to that sailor who's gone uh, to Alipo, master of the ship called Tiger. It was a reference to this belief of King James the Sixth. Uh, and uh, very interestingly, the way of identifying and establishing a real life witch was also very strange, or was very strange. There were many ways. One was the presence of witch marks, a mark supposed to have been put on a woman's body by the devil. Witches were also said to have familiars, demonic creatures, which might happen to be cats, dogs, mice, rats, or other small animals. She was believed to nourish her familiar with her own uh, blood from a teat located on her lower body. Another claim was recovery after counter magic. If someone was unwell and under a spell, uh, sorry, uh, if someone was uh, unwell and a spell helped him recover, then this was seen as evidence that the original illness was caused by witchcraft. It was also prevalent that if one believed he has been under a spell of a witch, he would scratch that supposed witch above her heart and drew her blood it would evaporate her powers by the breaking of her skin. And after that, if he recovered, the woman was certainly a witch. Yet another way to prove, uh, I think Gautam has gone offline. So I think he is also asking uh, me to stop. So I will stop here. Or uh, I think I can continue. Uh, if you can see me, I can continue. Uh, so as I was saying, yet another way uh, of proving someone was a witch was to extract confessions from that person. A witch like came very the easily in fear of their lives and sometimes under extreme torture. But the most atrocious way of proving someone a witch was the water test. Water was seen as inherently pure. A suspected witch would be tied up and flung in a pond or lake. If she floated, it, mean, it meant rather that the water had rejected her and therefore she was conclusively a witch. But if she sank, it was believed that the water accepted her and therefore she was not a witch. But of course, the innocent woman would be dead by drowning. And the third interpretation uh, of the witch uh, is that in real life, it was actually the old, poor, often widowed women who were often accused of being witches. These women would beg for food or drink. And when they were turned away, they uh, might have responded angrily. Later, when something unfortunate, a bad harvest or an ordinary illness happened to the person who had denied the woman charity, the old woman would be blamed for their problems. And these acts were seen as fears enactment on stage of the witches plotting mischief would have intensified familiar fears of the harm witches could perform in daily life. Uh, I don't think Gautam is there, so I'll not be able to show you the slide. Yeah, you continue. I'm here. Indeed, continue. Uh, at the height of which I'm here, you continue. trials, almost all those accused were women, and many of them poor or economically, economically vulnerable, who, 
like the witches of Macbeth, might beg their neighbors for something to eat. And I quote uh, from Macbeth, Act 1, Scene 3, a sailor's wife had chestnuts in her lap and munched and munched and munched. Give me, quote I, a royal thee, which the rum-fed Runyon cries, unquote. And then her mischief following anger. She says, I quote, I'll dry him, dry, I'll drain him dry as hay, shall he dwindle peak and pine, unquote. It is also true that some of the accused were convinced that they were able to do magic and others could actually perform magic, but not ordinarily. They could only perform magic in stages as we see in act four, scene one of this play, the cauldron stream where the witches raised the apparitions. Uh, while the witches in Macbeth boasted about their magical practices, in reality, most of those accused did not practice any form of magic at all. And those who did were only successful because their alleged victims were willing to blame them for their own misfortunes or diseases. In Shakespeare's England, anxiety about witchcraft and belief in magic and the supernatural were not limited to the lower classes only. Sir Walter Raleigh, uh, who was one of the Queen's courtiers, described witches as women controlled by the devil. Even in the play, Macbeth, who was a powerful man of high estate, and though at times he questions the validity of the three witches and their prophecies, he too ultimately accepts the potential of witchcraft and magic and seeks them out to learn about his future. Uh, so I have two slides in which I'm going to talk about uh, the uh, two famous witchcraft trials, but uh, I don't think Gautam is online. Sure. 15, the first yes, I'm online. Trials, you continue. 15, I'm online. Eight. And especially notorious witchcraft case was that of Elizabeth, known for her harsh temper and who, it was said, nourished a familiar uh, with her own blood, and that was a rat, and had a witch mark on her side. She often begged and was indeed irritated when she was rebuffed. On one occasion, an innkeeper who had refused to give her food subsequently became ill and was convinced style had bewitched him. Uh, in the method long believed to cure a spell from a witch, he scratched style and drew her blood and recovered. It also didn't help that style was associated with a crippled woman known as Mother Margaret. In Windsor, Elizabeth style and the other women were tried for witchcraft and all were found guilty. Under torture, Style had confessed and claimed that Mother Devil had got her involved in witchcraft. All of them were hanged on 26th February, 1579. Uh, the second case that I will refer to was in 1593 in the town of Warboys, a poor woman, Alice Samuels, and her husband, John, and their daughter, Agnes, were all on trial. Accused of bewitching the daughters of the wealthy Robert Sockmorton, since 1589. The Throckmorton girls were young and their accusations were preposterous and naive, but they were still seen as victims. After great pressure, Alice Samuels confessed, but her daughter, Agnes, convinced her to deny the confession and the Throckmorton girls then claimed that Agnes was a far worse witch than her mother. Agnes was proclaimed, Agnes always proclaimed her innocence, but she, her mother, and her father John were found guilty and executed. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that the Windsor witches and the Samuels family were among the thousands who lost their lives because of entrenched belief in witchcraft. In spite of skeptics like Reginald Scott, many believed that women could harm their neighbors through occult means. Unlike the witches of Macbeth, the women accused of witchcraft in Shakespeare's England could not actually prophesy, disappear into thin air, or summon spirits. Uh, many of them, like Elizabeth Style, uh, the Samuels family and the other witches of Windsor, were actually poor, vulnerable, and powerless. 
but given the cultural anxiety anxieties about uh, the threat such marginalized people possess to the community and the willingness of the courts to accept such implausible evidence to prove witchcraft it is tragic uh, but not surprising that so many uh, of the accused were found guilty incidentally charles the first who succeeded james the first did not believe in witchcraft so when in 1634 the lancashire trial began and the examining midwives located teats or marks on the lower bodies of the accused women especially around the vulva and the anus charles the first sent his personal physician william harvey to examine the witches upon examination harvey dismissed the midwives witch marks as the result of credulity and superstition declaring that the uh, suckling teats they found were actually hemorrhoids now ironically after punishing many witches uh, as as james the first reign progressed he himself grew more and more skeptical about the existence of actual witches the witches of the play are unsexed or rather their gender is to banco problematic because they have beards but i asked what kind of markers are beards in women they are the markers of old age or hormonal imbalance uh, when hair grows in places that were smooth in young women it can happen because of old age or it can become i mean it can uh, come out because of hormonal imbalance what banco is seeing is actually a body unsexed by old age and hormonal imbalance we find that that is how lady macbeth marks her body to old age begins uh, or uh, brings many of the functions of the female body to a halt lady macbeth is making in effect the same choice as those women but she is making it in a much more comprehensive way she is asking for an early menopause and that is why she asks that her blood be made thick she would have been celebrated today uh, by the my life my rules club uh, similarly the witches of macbeth are so old that not only have their organs sh- simply shriveled up but their physical deterioration also in- inverts the elderly sisters into gender confusing self indulgent selectively remembering and outspoken creatures uh, even the songs and the dance of the witches also serve an important purpose in the play uh, though many scholars like uh, b j sokol reject the singing and dancing witches of the hecate scenes act 3 scene 5 and act 4 scene 1 as almost certainly extra shakespearean interpolations yet there are reasons why shakespeare could have written them the witches dance was supposed to be an empowering occult experience within the coven so uh, james the 6th while interrogating the north uh, berwick witches as i have already referred on charges of trying to shipwreck him had asked one gillis duncan a member of the coven to dance as part of corroborating evidence so that he could prove her guilt a shakespeare was perhaps alluding to that and showing how the powerful dance of the witches were now only for the entertainment of the kings macbeth in the play and james the first in the audience during the private performance of the play thus rendering the witches powerless uh, the witches of macbeth have therefore become figments of comedy uh, always celebrating their own happy ending always opposing male knowledge with their teasing of male fears of subversion the striking factor uh, in all these scenes is the representation of the warm social life of the witches gathered together for fun mischief and sharing of stories among friends uh, sustained through regular meetings remember uh, the first line of the play the first which asks quote when shall we three meet again unquote and then later again in act 1 scene 3 she asks her sisters quote where has thou been unquote even hecate appears later only to complain about being left out of the witches games 
and berates them for wasting time on Macbeth. Uh, we do not find any social life or any of the other characters of the play. They are either plotting or gossiping. Uh, Gautam, can we have the slide? Next slide. Yes. No, I don't think so. Yes, fine. yes, I'm here. Is so it fine? that is why. Uh, yeah. Could you find it? Yes. Could you? Terry, okay. Terry Eagleton one. Yes. That is why. Terry, yes, 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 okay. Gautam. Yes. That is why Terry Eagleton perhaps said, "Quote: Positive values in Macbeth lie with the, with the three witches, the heroines of the piece." Unquote. Who reject the violent, oppressive society of hollow men and choose to be, quote, exiles, inhabiting, or uh, inhabiting, sorry, their own sisterly community on its shadowy borderlands, unquote, infiltrating the Macbeth world with their riddles, but preferring their own world of otherness and playful non-meaning, quote, androgynous, bearded women, multiple, three in one, and imperfect speakers, the witches strike. At the stable social, sexual, and linguistic forms which the society of the play needs in order to survive. Unquote. What I have tried to suggest in this discussion is an alternate way of viewing the witches in Macbeth, not as figures of fate, not as uh, malicious tools of the devil, not as the sick and impoverished old woman accused of retaliatory witchcraft on the basis of charity denied, but as critical responses to a community in which patriarchal disorder is so pervasive that only a matriarchal parody can find the loophole and escape to a new order. When we see the Scotland in the play, uh, it is fraught by inept leadership, civil war, and foreign invasion. No matter what we say, Things under Duncan were not at all well. And Macbeth himself is a failed hero. Uh, here, I'm tempted to talk a little about the Perseus myth. Gautam, can we have the next slide, please? Uh, in the myth of Perseus and his quest for Medusa's head, uh, yes, thank you. He gets directions to reach Medusa from the Grey Sisters. Through this quest, Perseus seeks public acknowledgement of his valor and political acknowledgement as his grandfather's heir. Yes, this is, this is the Perseus with the head of Medusa. Uh, can you move on to the next slide, please? We may see the three gray sisters who help Perseus as the reluctant version of the weird sisters in Macbeth. They were the cousins of the Titans and the Gorgons and were ancient and sleepy women. They were toothless and blind, possessing only one tooth, and one eye in common. They passed these items from hand to hand as the need arose. Perseus stole them while they were passing it around and forced them to give him directions to reach Medusa. Surrounded by the human world of ambition, greed, desire, and mean-spirited self-importance, these sisters, like the weird sisters of Macbeth, live harmoniously together, isolated from the chaos beyond their cave, sharing the same taste and vision and indifferent to others. Yes, there you can see the three uh, are the Grey Sisters and they are very much like the three weird sisters in Macbeth. So if we see Macbeth as a kind of Perseus, he is a hero whose valor with the sword is already clearly demonstrated in the bloody slaughters reported at the beginning of the play and whose quest for acknowledgement as Duncan's heir pushes him in contact with the weird sisters. But Macbeth's witches or weird sisters leave their dark pursuers to his fate. And instead of decapitating and proclaiming his victory over Medusa, he himself becomes the Gorgon, losing his own head in the process. In the play, we find that even after Macbeth, neither Malcolm nor Macduff seem to offer any viable option. Malcolm tests people by lying, and Macduff thoughtlessly abandons his family to slaughter. So what I am contending is that if there is more to these characters than the negative, then there is more to Lady Macbeth and the Weird Sisters too. In conclusion, I can say 
that although Shakespeare reflects and at times supports the English Renaissance stereotypes of women and men and their various roles and responsibilities in society, he is also a writer who questions, challenges, and modifies these representations. Shakespeare's plays are layered. They have hidden meanings and significances in them. Maybe, I'm saying maybe, though Macbeth, though through Macbeth, he was celebrating uh, the ascension of James I, the English throne, uh, I don't know, he may also have been celebrating the end of the female rule and the beginning of the male rule in England. Uh, I don't know, maybe he, he believed in that or he was trying to show that he believed in that. We can never be sure. All that I can say is that his plays afford opportunities not only to understand Renaissance culture better, but also to confront our own contemporary generations and notions about gender and power. So it is up to us, Gautam has already put up the slide, to decide how we want to see Lady Macbeth as the power hungry woman who is devilish and covets the crown or a, rep a woman who stretches herself beyond her limit only uh, to realize her husband's dream. And it is also up to us to decide how we wish to see the the witches or the weird sisters as really demonic creatures existing in society or not so harmful, although odd creatures as the poster represents. And finally, thank you. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Over to you, Gautam. And thank you very much. It's been a long time that uh, you are, okay, some uh, notes you have uh, also given, some notes are there. So if anyone... Yes, yes, like to... for people who are interested, I have the whole reference and the notes. Uh... Notes also, I'm just uh, showing it on screen so that if anyone would like to get that, you can get this one. If you can't, note it down right now so you can get it down after the program over because uh, that will be recorded uh, here. That is being recorded rather. So you can find these notes from this recorded lecture. So let me, okay. Uh, Shorabda, we have some questions. I think uh, mostly one question I'm yeah, finding. Sure. And there are several things, several, uh, okay, one. Uh, okay, let me just uh, bring yes. this question on screen. So I think your face is not found. But still, I'm just reading out the question so that you can get that. Will you find the question on your screen? Yes, yes, yes. I, I'm reading out the question and then I'll be answering it, sir. Uh, one of my students' question is, what happens to Fleance at the end of the play? The witches had prophesied that Banco's son would be uh, the king, but we find Malcolm becomes the king of Scotland after killing Macbeth, and the play ends in Act 5, Act scene 5 9. Scene. Yes, a very interesting and uh, sorry, Act 5, scene 9. Yes, very interesting and very pertinent question. So uh, I will definitely answer that. Uh, actually, I'm itching to answer that. You see, the witches had made three prophecies, that uh, three prophecies, and then... Uh, all of them came true uh, to Macbeth, that uh, Thane of Cawdor, Thane of Glamis, Thane of Cawdor, and King thereafter. But uh, they also had made a prophecy to Banco that you shall not be king, but your sons will be king hereafter. And also that uh, when Macbeth goes to the, to the witches in the cauldron scene, they show him a line of eight kings after Banco. And it is also believed that James the First, King James the First of England was actually a descendant of uh, the line of Banco, uh, the house of Banco. So uh, why did Banco's son not become uh, the king? Why is it not shown that Banco's son became the king uh, till, uh, when, uh, when the play ended? Why is it left like that? Uh, There's a very good question. Why Shakespeare did it? Only Shakespeare knows. But what I can tell you is that in one of the movies, I am not too sure. It is most probably the throne of blood. There it is shown that as the play ends, uh, King Malcolm, now he's a king, he is now uh, giving out rewards to everyone uh, and he's making a speech. And in that movie, we are shown that Macduff is actually returning home. He has no reason to stay and collect the rewards. His reward is already collected. He has already killed the killer of his wife and children. Uh, so he is returning home. And as he is returning home, he goes through a heat, and then in that movie, the witches appear in front of Macduff, and the movie ends. So this is very interesting. I would like to interpret that by saying that maybe the witches now corrupt 
Macduff in the same way that they had corrupted or they had uh, they had instigated the corruption. They had played upon the corruption that was already there in Macbeth. So maybe they now play up Macduff, who revolts against uh, King Malcolm, and therefore maybe he kills King Malcolm, and therefore uh, maybe later he is killed by Fleance, who had run away, and then then Fleance becomes the next king of England. That is the only plausible uh, explanation that I can find. Yes. Okay, as I find no uh, question over here in the comment box. So uh, thank you very much, and uh, I hope that you have enjoyed the session because uh, uh, there are several problems uh, who are watching. I think they have an. Uh, I have tried my level to continue it, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shoda Banerjee, for giving your valuable time to us and uh, giving such a wonderful and insightful lecture. I hope that all the uh, viewers. Who have uh, watched it and who will watch it later also in the comment section, they will be very much benefited by your very special lecture. And uh, there are several uh, uh, wishes and also greetings have come. So I'm not uh, going through one by one. You can also find it. So I'm not going through this one, but one uh, one thing I must mention over here once again, thank you very much for this insightful lecture. And if you, honestly speaking, I'm also very much enriched by your, this special lecture. So on this very note, so thank you very much. And uh, the viewers uh, who would like to get our session four, that is going to come on Monday at 7 p.m. So you can find us on 7 p.m. on Monday. And we are going to uh, come back with the four, session four. So thank you very much for your love that you have been pouring uh, uh, for the Department of English. So on this note, thank you very much. And uh, good night to all of you. I'm going to come back on Monday at 7 p.m. Till then, ta-da, bye-bye. Stay safe and stay protected.